so excited to have this talk today with our amazing panelists, Jesse, Winnie, and Harrison. Okay, so yeah, here we go. Okay, um, my name is Jesse, and I'm really so excited to be here. Um, and I work as the national director for ISEC Uganda, but also in January this year, I was appointed as uh, the executive director of ISEC. Yeah, um, I I'd love really to, to draw to you the picture of ISEC. Yeah, ISEC is basically a youth organization that started way back in 2016 after youth conference in Germany. And the major goal of ISIC was basically to, to mobilize a global youth-led movement for climate justice. We understand there are very many people who are doing so much to contribute for climate justice. And the majority of these people are basically scattered around the world. So what ISIC does basically is to gather everyone to ensure that we have a common voice and a common ground. And I'm excited to tell you that currently we have engaged and still engaging over 32 countries around the world. So we're not only just speaking about countries in the global south, like Uganda, my country, like Cameroon, like Nigeria. We're also speaking about Canada, we're speaking about Asia, uh, Indonesia, and very many other countries. And we're very delighted to reach out to about uh, 18,000 people, especially the youth. Uh, and through this, we've been able to organize and participate in over 19 international conferences. Yeah, and, and basically, uh, one thing that stands out here is um, we majorly empower the youth environment activists with resources like leadership, mobilization, and finances so that they can carry on their activism work. I'll be happy to tell you that to date, we have registered over 75 successful campaigns. Yeah, back to the host, please. Hello, everyone. I don't know if you can hear me. My name is Harrison. I'm from Cameroon, and I am. I was the. I am the, presently the national director of ISEC in Cameroon, and and as JC, I was also appointed in twenty this year, early this year in January, as the executive director. So I and JC were co-executive directors of ISEC for now. So basically, I came to Cameroon in 2017 under my leadership. And, and so far, we've been doing a lot concerning the environment work in Cameroon. I would also like to say I am an environmental engineer. I'm an environmental engineer and I have a master's degree. So when I came to Cameroon in 2017, we have engaged almost 10,000 young people directly through our education programs and campaigns. And we also launched Plan for the Planet Initiative. Plan for the Planet Initiative is an inter-school tree planting competition that started in Nigeria. So we extended that activity to Cameroon and we've engaged over 20 schools, 20 schools in Plan for the Planet. Basically what we do is we educate students about climate change. Then we try to to, to to get them involved in local mitigation strategy like planting of trees. So schools get into competition where they plant trees at the end. The school that plants the highest number of trees and more students that are engaged will have half prizes. So this has been going on in Cameroon for the past. We launched it in Cameroon in 2017, but it started in Nigeria. Also, we've also launched as we work with students in schools, we've launched three environment clubs in secondary schools in, in the country. We believe that in order to continually give students platform where they can engage in environmental activism, it can be true clubs. So we launched three environment clubs and we are hoping to launch more in future. And, and as an advocate, we also train, I say Cameroon, train over 50 young people in Cameroon in environmental activism and advocacy because most of the young people that we work with that had basic idea 
about activism. So we train them based on, on our experience. And we've also run, run several online campaigns, especially when the coronavirus came, we had limited, limited with the lockdowns and everything. We couldn't go out for our normal activities. So we've run a couple of online campaigns and which has really been successful. So basically that's an idea of how ISEC has been functioning in Cameroon. I don't know, let me pass it over to the host. Uh, yes, we have pictures of some of our activities that has been run in Cameroon. So these are some of the pictures that we see on the screen. Plan for the Planet Initiative we launched in 2017. And then we, we engage students also in environmental protection and conservation, like, like the tree we give to schools. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, as as Jesse and Isaac, I I feel very excited to be to be here to speak about what we are doing, because believe me, you, we are changing lives. I'll 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 just glance you through. Um, Ever since Isaac came to Uganda in 2017, and I was appointed as the national director then, uh, our first project, basically, we wanted to see how can we ensure that we have uh, more leaders on ground, people who are empowered to carry on the message of climate justice. And by so doing, well, we organized the Young Leaders Forum in 2019, which benefited over 250 youths within Africa. Very many young people were coming from countries like Rwanda, Nigeria, South Africa, to see that they can benefit from this leadership program. And that was remarkable. Um, and what makes our work so unique is basically the idea that each country has the role to, to organize or initiate a project which is practical within their countries. And what we discovered from our research was that much as the UN SDGs were quite popular in the global North countries, but they were known in countries like my country, Uganda. So we started, we initiated what they call the UN SDGs Awareness Run. This benefited thousands of young people. The government of Uganda really loved the idea so much that it actually adopted this, uh, this run. So it happens every year. Yeah. We have done so much, but I, I, I'll just tell you something that we, oh, we're fighting, we're still fighting here. We have what we call Udongo Forest. Uh, if, if, uh, um, if you're so glued on social media, you've been seeing posts like Save Udongo Forest. That was a campaign that we started as ISIC. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, so that was majorly a campaign that we started to try and stop government from selling off that forest reserve. It's too absurd that government chose to sell off that forest reserve, but from the pressure we have put, government is trying to reconsider. Yeah, and that project really was started by ISEC. Another really very important project was we discovered that as young people, we have got to be role models out there in the society. However, single-use plastics was everywhere in academic institutions. So we put up a petition, an online petition, to ensure that single-use plastics are actually banned in academic institutions. And that, I'll be happy to tell you that that project succeeded. And government approved it, 
to the point that it's awaiting implementation. And we've also really gone ahead to plant about 3,000 trees all over the country. That is amazing. That is amazing. Another really important work that, that myself I do is when you look at Uganda, it's, it neighbors a young, a, the youngest country in the world called South Sudan. This, this country is just about nine or 10 years old. They recently got their, their independence. But if you look at the practices happening in this country, it's so horrible and civilization is so high. The grounds are really very hostile. But as Isaac, the idea was we leave no one behind. I was motivated by all that to the point that I had to move about 10 hours on the road to go and start or introduce Isaac in South Sudan. And within South Sudan, we basically identify young people and then we train them and try to initiate them into the activism work. And we have worked with a number of NGOs that side. Next slide, please. So these are some of the, the photos. I, I'm not really good with, uh, with slides, so I, I, I can't really put all the photos into this photo, but you can see that is one of the projects that, that we did, the UN SDGs run, the other was basically the, uh, uh, the forum. And down here, on your left down, are basically young people trying to protest against government, against the government's idea to sell off the Budongo forest. Yeah, back to your host, please. Okay, hi guys. Uh, I'm Winnie, um, and since uh, 2017, I've been the National Director of Indonesia. I'm now a master's student uh, in environmental engineering in Italy. And as you guys are seeing now on the slide, these are what we have done in Indonesia. Uh, so in the beginning, just like Jesse and Harrison, we uh, tried to um, involve um, students and youth uh, with Isaac Indonesia. And we try to collaborate with other youth environmental organizations. We started with like Plan for the Planet, be it on the mountains or like in the coastal area, as you see in the slides, like uh, we plant like mangroves too. Uh, and in 2018, uh, yeah, in 2018, we had our first Eco Youth uh, Forum in uh, Maluku, Eastern Indonesia, attended by 50 students. Uh, not so long after that, we had uh, an eco camp for three days, uh, uh, attended by 430 students, and we successfully planted around 2,100 uh, trees around the camp area, which was burned before. Uh, and uh, these last years, uh, so yeah, Indonesia is like the second most plastic polluter in the world. So we want to focus more on the plastic. That's why we had um, uh, like exhibition and forum about uh, break free from plastic with uh, University of Bosowa in Indonesia, which is now our partner. And we are planning to make the first uh, zero waste center in the, uh, in, Indonesia, in the middle part of Indonesia but we need to wait for a bit because now it, uh, the COVID and stuff. Um, and earlier last year, we decided to enhance our focus more on the indigenous community since we found out how dirty they were being played by the big, uh, big corporates in, in, in the Eastern part of Indonesia. And yeah, it's obviously like these big corporates can uh, can do this to the indigenous community because the government allowed them to do so. So this is um, more challenging, this project is more challenging 
to us because uh, it's we need to deal also with politics, but we are so motivated to do so because not only at this point, these indigenous communities, like we are the only chance they, their voice can be heard, uh, uh, but uh, there are more problems, more complex problems uh, with these indigenous communities, uh, such as like when they don't have proper educations or electricity and even like poverty. So we are really motivated to uh, work with them. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm not sure if Harrison is able to hear us, um, but if Jesse or Winnie, if either of you would be willing to um, talk about this, that would be great. Well, I, I, am, I think I'm ready. I'm sorry, my connections no, no are really not so good. Hello. So, so now how uh, we want to talk about climate change in the global south. So how, how does climate change really happen in the global south? Now, basically, when we talk about global south, I'll, I'll limit my scope to Africa. I will try to limit my scope to Africa because if you look at the whole of global south, you have China, you have India, and you even have Brazil. But let's let's focus a bit on on Africa. Globally, if you look at, it is said that the Africa contribute the least to to global emissions, but but they suffer the they suffer the most of the impacts of climate change. So so the diagram just give us a fair idea a fair idea of, of the global contribution to climate change. So if we are looking at Africa, the only country that has really high contribution is South Africa. South Africa is almost 1% of the global contribution to, to climate change. But this is very dismal as compared to the US with over 19%, over China over 25% of global greenhouse, global greenhouse gas emission. Now, if you look at also other countries like Nigeria, which has a very, which one of the greatest countries in Africa with the highest population, Nigeria has just 0.5%. And now, globally speaking, Africa contributes just 3.8% in terms of global greenhouse gas emission. So, so, so you, you, we, you understand that we contribute the least to global greenhouse gas emission, and then, but the effects of this global gas emission are actually the effects of climate change are very impactful to Africa. Now, if you take it forward, you look at how individual countries affect, <coughs> contribute to climate change. If you look at the US, there's the study that <coughs> the amount of energy, the amount of energy used by, 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 by people in California playing video games is equivalent to the energy consumed by Senegal alone. So please, I don't know if the host can go to the next slide. The next slide where we have a figure. So, so if you look at this figure from sustainable energy, you see that look at the energy consumed by, 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 by the entire country of Senegal is equivalent to the energy consumed by Californians playing video games. Well, I don't play video games, but this really tells you how, how there's energy poverty. So if there's energy poverty, how do we contribute to climate change? So the, our impact is this small. But this does not mean that we shouldn't contribute to the global fight. So, so, so I think when I talk to most some learned, learned people in Africa, in Cameroon in particular, they always ask me that why am I talking so much about climate change? Our effects on the planet is negligible as compared to, to the global north. Why should we keep on? Why should we, we do what the global north is to be doing? Well, I believe that climate change affects all of us. If it affects all of us, it means that we need to take action in our own little way. Now, if we try to go further again, another study says that it would take an average Ethiopian. Ethiopia is a country of Africa with also very high GDP annually. If we take an average Ethiopian 240 years to register the same carbon footprint as the average American, that was from the Africa Progress Panel. You see, you see this discrepancy of, of, of our impacts on the environment and Globally speaking, how we, we, we cause climate change, our activity, human activities, global greenhouse gas emission. So Africa 
contribute a very small, small percentage, but we are still very prone to the impacts of climate change. Climate change is, is, is actually something that is real because we face it every year, every day in our countries. In 2018, there was flooding in Zimbabwe that killed over 100 people. In Mozambique, there was flooding. I mean, it is recurrent. The impacts are recurrent in Africa. And we can, we, can, we can look at it this way. The reason why we are so prone to the impacts of climate change, firstly, it is because we have low adaptability capabilities. I mean, our adaptability is very low because our, <coughs> our structures, our living conditions, the living conditions of Africans in general are poor. So this actually, the impacts of climate change exacerbate these poor conditions. And the impact is really felt by the common people in the society. So, so sometimes when we go to the field, I mean, to talk about climate change to smallholder farmers, to smallholder farmers in villages about how their impacts cause climate change. They are ignorant, but then they have very dismal effect to global greenhouse gas emission. But we won't stop fighting. We won't stop talking to them about the little actions that can do, because it's these little actions that culminate to give us a global effect. I mean, so, so it is very, very important. The next slide also look at how climate change is, is, is affecting Africa. I don't, the host, can you go to the next slide? So we can also say that if you look at the economy of Africa in general, Africa in general, 40 to 44% of Africa's economy is sustained by agriculture. And, 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 and agriculture is one of the sectors that is highly impacted by climate change. So you can see the impacts of climate change on Africa's economy through, through agriculture. So this is why, why when you look at the global climate talks, global negotiation, Africa really has to, 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 put, forth, to, 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 to put forth strategies that will help them to adapt to to the changes that is already affecting their economy is something very, very, very important. Though we contribute least as Africa and generally some part of the global south, the island states, it is it is very important that we should not leave some people. We should not leave some people behind. The global north. I understand the differences between climate advocacy, climate justice in the global north and in the global south. So we should take along those in the global south. We shouldn't go and leave them behind because most people are ignorant. Even my, some people, learned people are ignorant about climate change. It affects them daily. I had an experience with, with local farmers in the Northwest region of Cameroon. I was talking about climate change and, and they tell me that this climate change I'm singing all the time. They don't, know, they don't know how they contribute to it. But when you explain to them, they understand that the, 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 the changes that they are witnessing because their activity is, is prone to, to, to climate variations. Farmers don't know where to farm. They don't know when to plant their crops. These realities are common. So we try to link these realities that they face to climate change and they get a broader understanding. But the most important thing we should take note is that we should not leave the global side behind. I mean, the very poor countries, let's carry along with them as we continue to fight for the future of the planet. So, so that was the little that I had concerning climate change in the global south, particularly in Africa, because I understand some of the situation quite all right in Africa. If we leave China aside, China, India, Brazil, that have a great contribution to climate change. But if you look at India, India also, the impacts of climate change are real, are real in India. India is a very, is generally, the per capita income of India is also very low. So the impacts of climate change to the common man in India is the same as that in Africa, which is something that we should consider when we, we continue to fight for climate justice around the world. Someone asked me recently if climate justice is really climate justice, because if we cause climate change the least, why should we be contributing to fight climate change? These are the realities. These are questions that some people will ponder over. So, so let's take 
our people behind. And I believe that young people can actually lead the movement in Africa and in other parts of the global South. Okay, so uh, now uh, I think I'm gonna be talking about the biggest obstacles uh, we face in Indonesia as uh, climate activists. Um, of course, there's a lot, a lot of lags. <laughs> the first thing is that the support from the government. So um, on the top of that, of course, is about funding because uh, all the time, anything that is related to environmental sector in Indonesia is strongly like underfunded. Um, so usually if we wanna do some project, we need to uh, look for the fundings from like, like other countries, for example. And also uh, there is no, so far that I know there is no sustainable like project uh, from the government, uh, environmental project from the government in Indonesia. So usually they only, um, they only uh, ha have this uh, one time project that uh, they only care about, okay, I will do this project, take, take a picture, put it on Instagram and that's all, but there's no like future fusion about it. Um, so actually, um, even like most uh, environmental movement or organizations in Indonesia, they are doing the same. Uh, and you know, uh, this one shot project, we don't usually solve anything. Uh, yeah. And the second one is uh, lack of awareness among youth because um, not like uh, in most developed countries, uh, climate crisis is not really popular in Indonesia. Um, if if you, you if you tell them like oh uh, our earth is getting hotter in Indonesia they will just say okay it's been always hot in Indonesia you know we're tropical countries <laughs> we are tropical countries so yeah uh, so actually the the youth um, most cases that we found they don't know what to do why do they have to do this um, or what can they contribute uh, how can they contribute. So yeah, but now I think Indonesia is trying to work with this to reach out to the youth and to uh, get them involved with our projects. Yeah, and uh, the last, uh, yeah, the biggest, the, the last biggest of the obstacle we face is that um, there's no solidarity between organizations like um, other environmental organizations that we try to reach out to um they kind of like so they just want to be um who is better than who so instead of like solidarity we are kind of like uh competing with each other um so you know it's it's just um harder to work uh by ourselves or by themselves and of course if we can work together uh we can like uh fix we can solve uh, big, bigger problems, uh, easier. So yeah, this is what we face in Indonesia. <laughs> oh yeah, um, <clears throat> the biggest obstacles that I personally faced doing the act uh, the activism is basically the intimidation and persecution from government uh, i'll be honest and tell you i've been arrested about three times and and released without charges really without being presented to court and what did i do to get there we're basically protesting against the sale of a full forest for sugar plantation. It, it, it doesn't make sense because the forest we're talking about here covers about 60,000 hectares with about over 500 species of animals, about 250 different types of birds. And a government wanted to sell off that, it actually did, 
But of course, we're still fighting and we won't stop the fight. Because a one investor came into Uganda and spotted that place. I'll be honest and tell you, people actually offered land so that this government can, can definitely give that same piece of land to, to, to this sugar company so they can, they can use it for plantation and leave the forest. The other biggest obstacle of first is basically persecution from farming. In Africa, climate change is a new thing. I'll be honest with you, it's a new thing. If you look at the people that understand climate change, it's basically the young people. And that is a very small population here. It, 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 it's just a peaking population. I had a very horrible experience after I graduated mechanical engineering, I got this offer to go and work with a drilling company, Total. It's, it's an oil and gas company. It's one of the best jobs a young engineer can definitely go for. And I look at this appointment later, and I'm thinking at the back of my mind, do I have to, con to promote climate Climate, uh, climate change or climate justice. Having thought all through that, I decided to turn it down. But that didn't go well with my parents. They actually almost banned me from going back to their house. Because in Africa, a kid has to, to get a job so he can definitely look after their parents. But I turned it down. Do I regret it? No, I don't. No, I don't. And I am not ready to become a promoter of climate change. The other big problem is basically the, the lack of finances to run activism. I understand there are very many organizations that can come in to help, but it's just not enough. Remember, before even we get to the actual activism, we need to first make people aware. And that takes most of the time. You need to first educate someone that if you plant, if, if you cut that tree, you won't get the rains. And if you don't get the rains, eventually you won't feed or your farming won't work out. It's a lot of explaining. It's a lot of empowering. The mindset also. Um, the information gap between the public because of the high levels of illiteracy. The other thing is climate change in Africa, the traditional media have actually tried to, 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 to portray it into something so unpopular to the young people. So you need to do a lot of explaining to have as many young people join you. Because climate action requires numbers for government to listen, for everyone to know. The other big obstacle is the lack of unity among the environmental activism individuals and organizations. And I think because everyone sources money from different sources, so they tend to do their work independently. Eventually, eventually you barely see results because everyone is doing their scattered piece of work somewhere. The other big thing is limited justice for the activists. Like I said, I was arrested when I'm protesting, peacefully protesting against the government. Was I presented to court? No. After a week, I was released. Not even on bond. To date, I still get calls from government. I have to report. No wonder I had to move and look out for where I can do my work much more better in South Sudan. So these obstacles are real. There are so many. 
There's so many, but allow me just share those. And back to the host, please. Thank you, thank you. I think like, like when it comes to the challenges or obstacles we face, it is common what is happening in Uganda, Indonesia. I think we have these common challenges. But my experience, like when I brought ISEC to Cameroon as a national director, I was an environmental engineering student. So I have this passion generally. So what I noticed when I was setting up my team, what I noticed was that my team members were all environmental students. It means either they're doing environmental science or they're doing environmental engineering. So these people are driven by passion. Now, but in, how do you get to the others, to the other young people? How do you convince them? So it takes a lot of explanation, a lot of motivation, a lot of conviction to have people join you. So this is the challenge we have. Young people are not interested in climate movement, environmental justice, because generally what they feel is that it doesn't give money. If you're not driven by passion, when you don't have money, you won't be able to do this. So, so that is a challenge we have. People lack interest, particularly long, young people in Cameroon. Cameroon is a bilingual country. So I was in the French part and the French part makes 80% of the country while the English part is 15 to 20%. So I was in the French part. Generally, the, the mindset of the French people, they don't like to work for free. I mean, educating people, it was really challenging for us. When we started in 2017, it was challenging to get young people involved. I even had to, to when I organized a training for climate advocacy, I had to motivate people, paying their transport, giving them feeding. That was out of my pocket. Sometimes you see the extra miles we go through to get young people involved. It's a serious challenge. And this goes back to finances. It goes back to finances. Like Jesse said, people have to be aware. There's no justice without awareness. So we first of all need to explain to young people. I mean, I think the target, Africa's population, more than 60% is below the age of 20. So this is a resource that we can target, but we need a lot of explanation. And young people are open if you give them the right motivation. So this challenge of finances is real, it's real. Sometimes passion does not really get the work done. Like I have gotten people convinced to join the movement through motivation, to motivate them. And you see, and they get you, they get to the movement. So that was the major challenge I had in Cameroon. And also another challenge is lack of support from the government. I don't know, it's the position of the government is like, we contribute least to climate change. Why should we be doing anything? I think that this is, this is common to, to the least developed, to, to the countries in the global south. We have our experience in Cameroon is that there's little or no support to environmental NGOs, to climate activists. We've not been arrested before, but that support is not there. We can't do anything. For example, I want to legalize a document as an environmental organization. It takes a lot of time. And six months, eight months, they don't do this. And it, it hinders our activities. So that lack of support is real, is real. And another one is lack of synergy and co collaboration among environmental activists and even environmental NGOs in the country. So that's a challenge. If we can't work together, we are working for the same cause. If that synergy is not there, and then we are doing the same thing. How can we collaborate more? So I say we are, we've been so excited to see, to start a coalition in ISEG continental coalition building in Africa. So it's, it's something great because synergy is not there amongst us, like in Cameroon, when I look, the, look at the experience of Cameroon. So we need this synergy among us. And I think that is something that we'll keep trying to do, keep trying to, I've partnered with a couple of organizations, but a lot of them are not open for partnership. I don't know why, I don't know why, because we are doing the same thing. Climate justice is climate justice. Climate awareness is climate awareness. Environmental awareness is the same thing for the future of the planet. So those are the challenges that we have. There are numerous, but these are some that we could cite. We could cite, but we should get young people involved. And it takes a lot of convincing, a lot of mindset change. The young people are not even interested. The old people are not even interested. 
The people who easily understand climate change are young people. People, old people, it's difficult to uh, targeting young people. That, that's why we work with schools, uh, communities with young people. And I think this is this is, this can pave the way forward for climate for the climate movement in Africa and across the global south. I'll pass it on to the host now. Thank you so much, Jesse and Winnie and Harrison for um, speaking on your experiences and what you guys do. I really appreciate it. You guys did an amazing job. Um, I'm going to ask um, panelists just a couple of questions. And for the audience, please feel free to put your any questions that you have for the panelists in the chat, and we will get to as many as we can. Um, and just to introduce myself, hi, I'm Kiana. I'm one of the uh, outreach directors for the International Board of ISEC. And it is wonderful to be with you guys here today. So the first question that I wanna ask all of the panelists um, is what do you guys think has been the key factor in you guys um, having successful campaigns and projects? Because I know that all of you have experienced numerous difficulties um, doing what you want to do and um, having these campaigns, which you guys have also had numerous successes. So what do you think were the key factors in you guys um, having successful projects? I don't know if I can go first. Okay, like like key to successful practice. I mean, the challenges of the climate movement of of what we've been doing in Cameroon are real. But then I believe that the key to this is passion in the first place. Like, so I went to college. My parents told me to study civil engineering. Uh, this and this is one of the fields that has a lot of money, particularly in Cameroon, because there's still a lot of construction work to be done. But I refuse. I'm not doing civil engineering. <laughs> I did environmental engineering. So, so like I think persecution to a certain extent has been part of part of my life since college to where I am today. So, so and when I graduated with environmental engineering, it was difficult for me to get a job. So I I, I wasn't really looking for a job. My family was worried, but that that that's the reality. I believe that the first of all is that passion. Why why did you get into the environmental movement in the first place? I wasn't satisfied with what was happening. I've witnessed a lot of flooding in the economic capital of Cameroon and even in the capital city. I mean, witnessed the first hand impact of climate change among smallholder farmers in Cameroon. So I, I really believe that my little effort could go a long way to, to cause a change, even if it takes some time. But that is what is driving me. How, the little actions that I can do. How can I help young people to get into the movement? How can I create awareness? If people don't know that this thing is happening and then there's no way we can solve the problem. So like an, as an engineer, I believe that first of all, before you solve a problem, you first of all know the cause of the problem. And when you know the cause of the problem, then you can then design a solution for that problem. So that is what has been keeping me. The motivation is the passion. That's the passion. I just want to live when I leave the earth. I mean, I'll be remembered for the little thing I did, did to contribute to a sustainable world and a sustainable planet. I hope my children will, will appreciate that in future. And so that is what has been driving the movement. So when we get to other young people, what do we do? We try to, get, I don't know how you transfer passion to others, but we try to make them see reason with you. As an organization, when you want to sell your vision to others, you try to make them see reason with you that why is this thing worth doing? So that's what we have been doing with Isaac. If you see the team that I had in, I've been having for the past three years, really great guys. And it's because you said a vision to them and how this thing can help our communities. So, so, so that passion should be there in the first place. Because sometimes you have persecution like Jesse. Jesse that was arrested twice or thrice, if that passion wasn't there, I mean, he would have given up. Why, why would he continue and be arrested all the time? So that is, I think that is the main thing for us. And when you see young people, 
another thing is when you have opportunities as an environmental ad advocate activist, it is like a motivation to other young people. So I've got a couple of opportunities. Like when I started the environmental movement, I've got a couple of opportunities. And I think it is motivating other young people to join, to join me in this. It has motivated a lot of young people. So these opportunities should be there. Let young people not see that I just do working for. If there's a way that they could be paying this paying environmental activity advocate, that would be good. Like, I mean, but the main thing is that passion, that resilience. Because in the face of challenges, you can give up. But that passion is it and, and your zeal. I think everything will be fine. So that's what has been keeping me going all this while for the past five, six years. Oh yeah, um, I'll, I'll dive in right away. Um, personally, unlike Harrison, I, I pursued mechanical engineering. And by doing that, I was at a disadvantage because you barely get to know so much about climate change uh, when you're doing such traditional courses. And, um, but of course, one thing we share with Harrison is definitely passion because I had to look for that information. I had to build myself with knowledge. And the more I read about the dangers of climate change that are threatening the future, the more I got glued into, into fighting for climate justice. Now, uh, one thing in Africa or in the global south, information about climate change has been hidden and hidden for only the people that are doing environmental related courses. Okay. Now, out of, out of passion, you can find that information, but it requires a lot of effort and sometimes some resources. I actually had to pay for some online books to read about uh, climate change. Yeah, the other thing that really helped me apart, besides passion was the approach. I, I, I joined ISIC at a point when I, I was in the university. If an our approach was first work with the students because students are, are more connected to information uh, just by a click. We had to get articles and share with students just to show them that you have no future that you're reading for unless you do something. Now, when it comes to activism, it starts with one person, then more numbers, and then small, more smaller numbers, and eventually very many people. So the approach was start with students. I, I believe if we had just started to the people, the illiterates out there, wouldn't be doing this because we'd be shattered or we would be stopped. The other thing that has really enabled myself and I'm sure Harrison and very many other people was to discover that there are other people in the global south, people like Kayla, Tiana, and very many other people in Isaac who are actually fighting, who are fighting with us. So learning that it's not only Jesse in Uganda, Harrison in Cameroon, but there are also other people in the developed countries, much as they contribute so much in the emissions, but they're doing so much to fight it also. So that really motivated me to continue and continue fighting for climate justice. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, if it's for me personally, um, Isaac has been giving me so much opportunities to connect with people, to do things for my country. So I think uh, the things that keep me going is that the opportunities have been always there, but I just uh, didn't know about it. So now that I know about it and uh, actually through Isaac, through this activism, I can do more and more. It always keeps me going. And 
the way we progress, the way we grow in Isaac Indonesia, um, I am so optimistic that uh, we can do better and better. Uh, and yeah, it's like more and more people joining us. So yeah, I think that's the way um, uh, I want to keep going on this path. And also, uh, usually uh, in Isaac Indonesia, we wrap our project in such a fun way that people would not think, okay, uh, if I get into climate activism, it's gonna be on, only lectures and lectures and lectures and dealing with politicians and we're gonna get arrested. But like, we make it like more fun, more um, easy to understand. So yeah, it's even now like uh, in Isaac Indonesia, we are kind of like a big family. So yeah, we keep all this atmosphere all the time within the organizations and uh, campaign that we do. Thank you guys so much. Um, all right, my last question, which does tie into what both Helen and Sophia um, asked was how do you think we can get more youth involved in this climate movement, um, particularly on an international scale, you know, um, getting more climate justice groups in the global north to work with you guys. And as Sophia also said, you know, asking about if donating is the best way for the global north to support your work, how do you think um, those partnerships should go? Oh yeah, um, um, I'll come in on that. Um, of course, donating is um, is um, is a very a, a very good way to to ensure that we carry on the fight. But most importantly, also learning that youths in the global north actually doing the same as well is a great motivation. So as, as I encourage as many people to continue donating for such causes uh, uh, in the global south, but also really taking on the fight in the global north and localizing it into small things like switch off the lights if you really don't need the light and, and, and such stuff can definitely be very helpful. Thank you. Let, let me just add to what Jesse said. Like, I mean, donating is is good. It's good because people need these finances. I mean, groups and coalitions. I mean, organizations in the global south. What what is their greatest challenges to be finances? But I also think that I mean, what Isaac has been doing is like Isaac is in thirty two different countries. The resources and organizational power that Isaac is giving to young people, a young person like me in Cameroon, a young person like Jesse in Uganda, we need in Indonesia and in other countries where Isaac is, is extending its tentacles. I believe that that resource is very important. Well, when I started Isaac as a new leader, I had some leadership skills because I'd been part, with, part of other organizations, but, but, but most young people in the global side, they don't have this. So how do we contribute more to training these people, to giving them this organizational power and support? So I believe that people in the global north, since there's already a lot of information, a lot of information about climate change, a lot of information about advocacy, activism in the global south, in the global north. So how do we get this information back to, to the global south, to these local people that need this organizational power so we can also focus on that, which is very important. Sometimes you give someone money who does not know how to, to lead a group of people. I mean, the money will just be mismanaged. So let's also focus on the organizational power. I, I mean, ISEC is doing something great. And I believe that we are planning to extend to more countries, but we cannot do it alone. We need this support, these resources, these financial resources, these training modules and everything to equip these activists, these young people in the global south. So, so yeah, that is a, a little that I can add to the question. Thank you.
Josie asked earlier, um, have Where? you? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, sorry about that. Um, Josie asked earlier, have you had much international support? If there is not much support where you are, are there organizations in other places that um, support you? Uh, for Isaac Indonesia, like all the fundings are from international fundings. That all the big projects that we have done, uh, none of them is from like Indonesian government. They are all international funding. So yeah, uh, for now we are like supported fully by international funding. Yeah, I think also that goes the same with Cameroon. That goes the same with Cameroon and a couple of countries in the ISEC network in under ISEC in our network. So so while ISEC as an organization can get some support from international organizations, some donors, these resources are channeled to individual countries. So the projects we run in Cameroon in Uganda, in Indonesia, some of these resources came from, from these in an international donors and international organization. Personally, I haven't received, we haven't received any national donation from the government or from the government or any local party in Cameroon. Person, we've used our personal resources, some support from family members, but we haven't had any, any support from the government or any national organization. Thank you guys for answering that. Um, Chris asked, what is the plan for youth activists in Africa um, concerning the government taking land for international organizations slash is there one? Sorry, please, can you repeat the question? I didn't hear well. Sorry about that. Um, I believe Chris asked, what is the plan um, for youth activists in Africa concerning um, land being taken by the government for international organization? Well, I, I haven't, let me give an experience in Cameroon. So, so there's the Ebo forest, there's an Ebo forest in Cameroon. It's actually one of the most ecologically diverse forests in the whole of Central Africa. So what happened is that the government leased this land part of a chunk of the forest to a foreign investor that was to lock most, I mean, more than 80% of the trees in that forest. So through this, this was a very grievous and a very dangerous thing for the government to do for the environment. So I believe that that was one of the only acts where I saw activists and international bodies, everyone coming together to, to, to talk against that project. So we talk, we wrote petitions, international. Personally, I was part of the part of the 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 the, 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 the group that was fighting for, for 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 against the project. And and unfortunately, because fortunately for us, because of the international pressure and the national pressure we had, the government had to suspend the project. But we are still fighting that the government should renew the project. They can suspend the project now, but in the future, they, they actually get they actually activate it. So 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 I think that land land by the government like our national government given to international organizations we should come together as youth organizations activists and form coalitions that when these things happen across the countries across in various countries we can use one one voice to tell the government that no this is wrong it is it should stop so so it is very important that these coalitions in africa they should sit up i hope that we can build what we can but we need coalitions, we need synergy among organizations, among activists, because one voice, when we join together as one voice, it's the government will listen. I believe me, the government will listen if, if the pressure is very hard on them. So I think that's the little experience I have. I've not heard about an international organization grabbing land, or the government giving land to an international organization in Cameroon, but they have, they have given a whole forest 
to a logging company from France, I think France and Switzerland, and we had to stop it. And I think more of this is coming in future, and we have to really sit up and be together in order to stop all this. Thank you. Yeah, and, um, and the same situation is basically happening in Uganda. Like, the same issue that really got me arrested. It, it was basically an international company that was given a forest like to, to cultivate on uh, um, sugar canes. But, but, but as, as Jesse and Isaac Uganda, we have to carry on the fight. We, we're not just giving up anytime soon, okay? And just two days ago, uh, we had um, uh, a very small coalition that was mobilizing resources to ensure that we carry on the fight and save Budongo Forest. And uh, I also I, I got information uh, from money inside and government that they're basically they could be calling us for negotiation anytime soon. So all I can tell you is Harrison, Winnie, and very many other activists out there, if you carry on the fight, the government will listen. The government listens to time. Thank you. I also saw that um, Daryl and Albert both kind of referenced um, how to collaborate with ISEC um, and other youth orgs. Um, so we are having applications for um, a new cohort of national directors coming out soon in June. Um, the information is in the chat if you uh, are interested in learning more about that. And we'll all leave our um, ISEC emails if you want to reach out to us with any questions regarding that. Um, but in general, um, if you guys could speak to your experience um, creating these uh, virtual partnerships and collaborations with people in other places. Um, how do you guys generally go about that? Slash, do you have any advice for um, virtual coalition building? I, I don't know if I got the question right, but is the question about virtual coalition building? Yes, like making how do we how do we go about? Yes. Uh, okay, so I don't know if JC has a better response to that, but I would say basically the the the, the coronavirus, the pandemic, has proven to us that very soon virtual all these virtual things are so much important. It should not be neglected because. For the past two years, we haven't been able to don 2020, 2021. 20, we haven't been able to don a lot because of the pandemic. So, so, so I think that it is important that we also focus on virtual coalition. Now, what ISEC is doing is that the coalition we are launching is basically for now, I think is people will be able to work virtually to collaborate virtually. And this platform also, this opportunity that we're sharing our experience, our work is also part of a virtual coalition. I mean, we are sharing contacts and emails from here. We can discuss one or two things that can help us together and build from there. So we should take advantage of the least opportunities we have to build virtual coalition. It is important, given that the new normal is that people stay at home and work from home if they can, work from home if this it go out only when it's absolutely necessary. So I think that is what I can say concerning that. Oh, I, I think I missed the question. The question was about um, advice or insight in building coalitions with people in other places, you know, through social media, virtually, that sort of thing. Oh yeah, um, I I feel social media is um, 
is a, is a great opportunity that we really need to take advantage of. Just this morning, I was, I was, I was speaking with Harrison, trying to, to, trying to know more about Cameroon. Uh, if, uh, if, for example, I want to, 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 uh, to, to, to go there for a vacation. So what am I speaking about here? It's basically that uh, much as we are doing the activism or we're fighting for climate justice, but friendship is key here. And, and this friendship is basically being facilitated by social media. So if, if, if we can build a coalition of very many activists around Africa and we build them on the basis of friendship, then we, we're sure we shall get results. And Jesse, would you be um, willing and able to speak more on our national director and coalition launch coming up? Well, I, can I take the national director launch that's coming up? Jesse, we talk about the coalition. So, so basically, the national director call, as I said, is in 32 countries, over 32, though some countries are barely active. We, we plan to extend to more countries, get more people involved, particularly in the global south, but not limiting the global north as well. Some countries don't have this kind of resources that we have. So we need to get these young people take the lead. So we'll be launching a call for application in June, most probably. So, so what we're doing before, we're doing an audit of the former national directors. So to understand their challenges and how we can better help them. So, so for those that are here and want to extend maybe ISEC to another country, they, they, can, they can check the website and social media that was on the chat. And then it will be launched in June, basically. So we'll call an application and people are interested. And, and believe me, we are taking this call for direction to another level because we want to train people. In the past, people didn't have that training. Some people are just passionate, but they need training, leadership training, advocacy. Advocacy is something that is tricky. Advocacy, activism. So we give them this training, these resources, this organizational power that they can champion the movement in their various communities and countries. So it's really an opportunity for us to, 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 to expand more. And we really need support, even if it is joining, donating. So it will really be great. So Jesse can talk about the coalition beauty that will also be launched around sometime in June. Oh uh, yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, okay, fine. Um, Isaac, we believe that the very many organizations out there that are doing it will, will work related, related to ours, a work of fighting for climate justice. However, if everyone is doing different kinds of work or related pieces of work where they're scattered. Uh, eventually the results may be shattered or, or, one, or one organization could be suppressed and eventually they lose everything. So what ISIC definitely wants to do, it wants to, to host all these organizations onto the same platform to ensure that we have the same target and everyone can definitely support each other. So things like resources, finances, and what and, and whatnot can definitely be shared so that we can reach uh, as, as, many, uh, as many people uh, as possible. So we, we are really, really, really excited to work with as many organizations as possible. So if you're listening out there and you have an organization or you know someone in an organization who is doing a work related to that of ISEC, uh, once we launch these coalitions, try to contact them so they can jump into this and definitely we can, we can work together. Mind you, as ISEC, we are not willing to take credit of any work or any uh, results or any activities done by different organizations. All we're doing is basically we're creating a platform where all organizations can come together for resource sharing, and then we can definitely go far. And Joshua, I believe that tied into your question, um, 
this, this like ISEC launch is not just for already existing members. We're definitely looking to um, expand, as Jesse said. So um, when that happens, you know, it will be on our social medias and you can feel free to reach out to um, us by email and um, discuss how to get involved. That's no problem at all. Um, and for all our panelists, if you have anything to say regarding Maria's question on uh, what are ISEC's goals for the next year. Right, let, let, let me try to answer that. So, so, so like for ISEC, what we are doing is we are planning to launch a call for application this year for national directors. So as from September, we have a new set of national directors. I mean, we're hoping to get as many as we can. And then the coalition will also be running. So ISEC will have a lot of work to focus on getting these national directors do a lot in their country to foster their, their vision that they have towards the environmental movement in their various countries. So I think that is that is a great challenge that we have, and we are preparing a lot. We are preparing a great deal based on the results of, 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 of our survey that we have done of the past national directors. There are a couple of challenges that they've had. Believe me, this environmental activism and movement in Africa has a lot of challenges. And it's real among these national directors. And we are trying to take that into consideration, assist them to the best of our ability in future. And, and I think that is, that is what will be our focus next year. And there are a couple of other international programs that we'll be focusing on maybe next year. If the things come to normal, we're thinking of doing things that will get people together. So, 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 so that is that is the main thing we'll focus on. But getting extending the tentacles of ISEC to other countries, getting things moving, building the coalition, it's what will really be on our playbook next year and subsequently. So that is that is it. Thank you. Um, if there are any more questions, um, you can leave them below, but if not, I just want to extend a huge thanks to Winnie and Harrison and Jesse for your wisdom, for sharing your experiences and having this discussion. Um, I think it was very informative and inspiring for everyone involved. And again, you guys can find ISIC on social media. I believe everybody's email is in the chat if you want to reach out to us um, and have any questions about ISEC in general. Thank you all so much for coming and participating and um, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>